Greetings, everyone. I hope you've sat on your motorcycle and revved it as hard as you can with your hands, because that's how you make it go is with hands, I think. I'm not a motorcycle person, as you know. I'm Van Lee. Manly Van Lee. Chose that name because it rhymed, not because it's accurate. Oh, and you're I'm, Manly. I uh, guess uh, more so than the people in this room, to an extent. <laughs> hey! <laughs> I am joined, of course, by those I two. I think my voice did the work for me It, there. it pretty much established Now, that's that not correct. fair. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joined by Brian Vaughn and Spencer Hendricks. Brian, welcome to the show. We're going to talk Renegade today. How excited are you? Well, I am very excited because for a long time... Uh, really, probably since we watched Walker, Texas Ranger, I've been hoping we'd cover a show that is devoid of any sort of idea <laughs> and exists for no reason at all and is very stupid. Except on motorcycles. <laughs> <laughs> we sure did exactly that with Renegade. Spencer, are you excited to talk Renegade? <laughs> yeah. I mean, did you have to ask? I can't wait. <laughs> it's for effect for the fans. That's how it works. They knew. They were waiting with bated I... breath. They wanted to hear you react. I always kind of forget about the fans and do this for me. So that's kind of my problem here. Is like I watch Renegade selfish. for me. Green. I, I really, when, every time I see something in these episodes, we watch privately. Because again, audience, we don't do this <laughs> together. We do this alone. We watch these shows alone <laughs> and we make notes. And I, I get so excited when I'm like, oh, I saw this part here. I can't wait to talk about this in the episode. <laughs> it I get really, so really into it builds the week up because we each know we've all seen the episodes, mm -hmm. but we don't talk about them we until try it's not time to, to yeah. talk about them. Now, details might get thrown in <laughs> here and there about levels of denim worn in episodes <laughs> of television shows, but other than that, we keep it pretty no spoilers. That's very true. Now, we have uh, so much to cover, so I'm going to just start right okay. away. No more banter. We'll get no right into banter. it. No more banter. I want to talk about Renegade as a whole. Oh, and actually, I guess I should toss this out at the top of the show. This is a monumental episode in that I have changed what we're doing. We talked last week on Hey Dude about doing... Hey Dude, for one. That's one well, thing hey we dude. talked about. About two episodes of Renegade, and I lied. I gave you two that I wanted to do. Well, here's what happened. I watched the first one, and this was maybe Sunday night, so it was very close after we recorded, and I knew you guys may not have watched it yet. I think Brian had already watched it at this point. I did. <laughs> I, it I was fine. It was pretty funny. Myself. Yeah, it was pretty funny. However... What happened to me was after I watched it, I thought, eh, that'll be okay, but it's, we'll see if the second episode's a little more bonkers. I was working on something else at the time. The next episode in the series came on, and I was like, oh, I need to shut this off. Two minutes into it, I said, this is amazing. We <laughs> have to do that one. So we're going to do that episode. Episode. That's what you watch on your iPhone, kids. <laughs> uh, we're going to do that Topical episode. Topical young people humor, I think. <laughs> second. So here's the order we're going to go on. Today's episode, we're going to discuss Season 4, Episode 22, The Road Not Taken. And then later on in the week, we're going to do Season 2, Episode 12, Hard Rider. And that one is going to replace Season 2, Episode 11, Honor. What Bound. is it? Honor Bound, yeah. Honor Bound, the Just same like name the as... Just like the 21 Jump Street one, yeah. Another, another connection to that Big later on, Big time connection. Way. So, yes. I missed that, but I'm excited to hear this. I noticed it first in the credits. So that's what we're going to do. I'm sorry to those of you out there who have already watched that first episode oh, of Renegade. Oh, what a shame. Uh, you got to watch a pretty cool episode of Renegade, but the new you one is treat. so much better, which we'll again cover later in the week. This one, however, still pretty good. But about the show overall, Renegade had 110 episodes spanning five seasons between 92 and 97. It's just unbelievable. It's crazy. <laughs> And it was first conceived by Stephen J. Cannell. Showrunner extraordinaire. That's right. Ooh, I'll talk more about him later. He created the show to capitalize on the burgeoning market for syndicated series. Now, we've covered other syndicated shows, notably Hercules and Xena, who kind of follow a similar format. They don't have a specific day that they release or are shown in wide markets. They're just bought to fill time. And that can be very successful, particularly back then, as Hercules and Xena were, Renegade wasn't quite as much, but still, it's kind of fun. And it, it did well enough to put up five seasons, of course, 110 episodes. Uh, he did cast Stephen Cannell, that is, cast Lorenzo Lamas as the titular Renegade. And Lamas saw the show as, quote, an opportunity to use his real-life martial arts and motorcycle riding skills <laughs> in a character role. I've been honing these. <laughs> For decades. Just waiting for the right opportunity to come up where both of these is in need. And you know, this is it. That we need somebody who can ride a motorcycle and beat some ass. And more on both uh, Lamas and Canel later. We'll get deep, particularly into Lamas's career. They filmed this show in and around San Diego and the surrounding suburbs. And to sell it, Canel created a montage scene set to the tune of Bon Jovi's Wanted Dead or Alive. 
<laughs> and that very which is so on brand for Renegade that I can't even put it into words. You would think that Wanted, Dead or Alive were written about Renegade or vice <laughs> yes. versa. I would think John Bon Jovi did it for this show. Honestly, <laughs> I really would. Now, the very same intro sequence that he used for that was later repurposed for the actual intro sequence in the show. Uh, of course, they couldn't license Wanted, Dead or Alive no. or whatever. So they made their own song, which I really enjoy and have listened to far too much over this past week. You'll hear about that in a little bit. It's a harmonica-laden tune by composer Mike Post. Now, the show did see some pretty good ratings, particularly in its first and second seasons, but it was panned widely by critics throughout the whole run. Huh. <laughs> and, <laughs> and even both Cannell and Lamas were disappointed with what was being written, mostly in the first few seasons. They complained that the show became more about the <laughs> guest stars than it did the actual cast, and there was really no linear narrative being told, which, considering this is syndication, is not really a bad thing, because, again, you're just supposed to catch episodes whenever, back in the Plus, glory I, days I'm of TV. I'm sorry, but if you sign on to Renegade... You know what it is. Yeah. And if you're like, oh, man, the artist in me is not satisfied. <laughs> well, you shouldn't be working on Renegade then. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't think, I don't think the guest star being a, a big draw is a bad thing. I, I, for Columbo TV. is what I thought. Exactly. About. Yeah. And, that, and of course, you know, Peter Falk held his own. But yes. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes <laughs> you have a, a guest star who does kind of make you want to watch a show. Are you implying Peter Falk did better than Lorenzo Lamas? I don't know. <laughs> I think he could solve that motorcycle gang crime in a second. <laughs> <laughs> oh, swap out Colombo oh, on motorcycles? Oh no. Man. He got ahead of us With here. With the hair? No, we'll, we'll do that in a couple weeks. Now, the plot of the whole thing is pretty basic. And sure, I could just tell it to you, but why would I do that when the show's <laughs> very own intro sequence straight up tells you what it's about? So th here it is. This is in every episode of Renegade. He was a cop and good at his job, but he committed the ultimate sin and testified against other cops gone bad. Cops that tried to kill him, but got the woman he loved instead. Framed for murder, now he prowls the Badlands, an outlaw hunting outlaws, a bounty hunter, a renegade. <laughs> <laughs> he prowls the Badlands. What so defines great. a Badland? Is it just the desert? Know. I, I thought don't a know. Bad Max. It's a specific like, area, yeah, right? Like a, I think, in, but in I don't Ohio, know. In South Dakota, <laughs> I know. Well, it's not up there, because I know they're out in like Arizona or Nevada. Yeah, Nevada. It might, it's probably like a large swath of area. Yeah. I guess the Badlands is that entire area of the United States. It is bad. Yeah. Like it's pretty a, bad. Like New Mexico as yeah, a whole. Yeah, the, the entire <laughs> rate, the entire range. I don't, I'm not going there. Oh, I'm not going you can to the hear the lands, motorcycle guys. revving in the in the background too. Obviously, you would have the audio of of Lamas on the motorcycle if you're oh, yeah. watching Certainly. the credits. But I I still like that. Just hearing the song, you still hear the purr <laughs> of that hog. And I had to keep it in there. I'm not going yeah. to take that out at all. So essentially, you get it. You get the idea of the show just oh, right away. It. Not yeah. only the idea, but the entire premise. <laughs> and you know, looking at this objectively. That's smart, I guess, if you're just making this kind of show. In the, in the intro song, though, right? That's kind well, of weird. it all adds up if you're people sitting around and be like, okay, look, our show is terrible. It's just we so shitty. It. Like, let's, what can we do to get, <laughs> the, like, okay, we need a little bit of a uh, backstory. We need to do some exposition. What do you think's the best way to do that? Let's and I imagine one writer saying, rather than best, what if we went for most efficient? <laughs> <laughs> that way we don't have to spend any time on it. They had 45-minute shows. They had time to fill. They could have yeah, done that differently. Yeah, just film that hunk dumping water on his body and just say what <laughs> oh, happened. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's totally a hunk, too. So Reno Reigns on the run from the law <laughs> is played by the aforementioned Lorenzo Lamas, who is, as I wrote here, sure not an actor. And now before I get into his info, I want to point out that IMDb has some categories that are maybe not as scientific as others, filmography I get it's what movies you were in yeah however this is more close to like the trivia section I ran into something called trademark not trademark trade space <laughs> mark okay so that tells me that IMDB corporate didn't come up with this one and this might have just been some fan making a trade mark segment but there's some interesting information there for you it has four items for Lamas listed his trade marks are <laughs> number one long hair yeah. Number two, very muscular physique. I don't know if I'd go that far. I mean, <laughs> he's in shape. He's in very good shape. He's very toned, but I mean, very muscular. I'm thinking You're like. You're thinking bodybuilder? Like Schwarzenegger. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. not a bodybuilder. Yeah. He's, just, he's just lean. Number three, deep, smooth voice, which I do not agree no. with. No. His voice is not smooth. 
he has sort of uh, the air of a man who's learning to speak for the first time. No, yeah, yeah. We we don't really know what he would sound like because he's such a horrible actor. Mm-hmm. No, there's a, of... there's a little bit of Hayden Christensen in there from <laughs> yeah. the Star Wars performance. Wow, I've forgotten all about him. <laughs> and the final little trademark in here, and my personal favorite is frequently plays roles that are unauthoritative and corrupt. <laughs> oh. Well, I thought he was pretty honorable in these. He was. I well, you know, getting to his disc- discography, his no. filmography later. Wait, and... hold on. <laughs> oh shit! I wish he was an artist. He doesn't have that. <laughs> What's your favorite L- Lorenzo Lamas <laughs> album? Yeah, I, I won't derail this, but I, have I have I ranted about IMDb in the past at all? Because I not wanted to my to. knowledge. I don't think so. Okay, good. You have I, the floor. Good. I, just real quickly, <laughs> when you said I'm not sure if corporate IMDb has approved of this. I'm not sure corporate IMDb has done anything for a very long time <laughs> because the site used to be a, a just a constant stopping spot for me. I mm-hmm. would often go to IMDb. They, uh, I think it was 2017, they eliminated their message board system to where you could talk about a movie or an actor yeah. on their page. I was furious because I, I went there all the time to see what people are saying about a movie mm-hmm. or an actor or whatever that I was interested in. So I go there all the time. They cut that off hmm. three, four years ago. I have not really been back to the site since. And the few times I have, it just doesn't seem to function all that well. It's kind of what you said. Just a there's, mess. There's kind of some, yeah, some unauthorized shit on there. And I don't even know what, it's It's a mess now. It's, it's, like, a, it's like a less edited Wikipedia <laughs> yeah. at this point uh, of just movies. So I've, I've been very disgruntled about the IMDb process over the last several years. So I'm I'm no longer a fan of that site, even though it, it started as a really admirable thing. I have lost also your business is what really it is. grown it frustrated with IMDb for the same reason. It's very cluttered. Well, as IMD Brian, that as, could happen. <laughs> yes, exactly. You're our a previous with blog them. that I wrote uh, like 10 years ago. It's probably still up, right? I don't know. I don't think so. Ah, shit. But yeah, IMDb has the look and feel now of a website that's like, six and a half years outdated or yeah, something. Yeah, a little too old. I don't it just think anyone's working function. on it anymore. Like, half of it is is trivia and, and goofs or whatever mm. that are just like, <laughs> this map said they were in Europe, but they were not, or something. You know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> and quotes that are not real quotes would be like three paragraphs. That's not a quote. Yeah, That's or a like statement. <laughs> classic quotes from this movie. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, you know, they had, I guess it's because they had a monopoly on the market for yeah. that, but you could have done a hell of a lot more with it. And there's something called IMDb TV. Oh. Yeah, I don't know uh, what that is. There's also yeah. a subscription IMDb or something. I'm because not... with that, and it's a lot of money, you get, I like, access to publicists and stuff. Yeah. So that, you get in emails or whatever. Yeah, that would be really fun, and I think you get more details on on shows and movies as well, oh, perhaps. Oh, okay. yeah. Well, anyway, I, I just had to... I've used IMDb... We'll expense it. I, I've, <laughs> I've used IMDb, too, for the stuff we do, but mm. otherwise, I, I don't go there anymore. Not so. as exciting, it's, yeah. it's got some problems. Back to Lorenzo Lamas here. He has been in a <laughs> what lot... What a sentence. <laughs> he has been a lot of direct-to-DVD, and I do that with quotations, because he really hasn't acted as much since the 90s. No. Uh, but he also has some big spots in his career, including his very first role, which was a non-speaking part in Greece. I guess he played like a goon or something. I would give him a non-speaking part. Non-speaking is the way to go. Yeah, Yeah. just let him be shirtless and don't say anything. He also played the lead role in a movie series called Snake Eater, and the second in the line was called Snake Eater 2, The Drug Buster. Sounds awesome. (laughs) He was in The Swordsman, Gladiator Cop, Terminal Justice, and a whole host of other bullshit roles. On television, he, of course, starred in Renegade, but also in a show called Falcon Crest, <laughs> which every time I read that, I do the Captain Falcon, Falcon Crest, as well as a multi-year run on The Bold and the Beautiful in the mid-2000s. He kind of is made for, for soap for opera. Soap opera yeah. work, yeah. yeah. You don't have to be able to act even remotely. Now, when I told Katie I was doing this, and I said, do you know who's in it or whatever, and I mentioned Lorenzo Lamas, she goes, I know who that is. I'm like, oh, I wonder what she's seen him in. Well, I'll reveal what it was is because I didn't know Queens? about it. No, but more on that later, too. In 2009, on E! Entertainment, that channel, they had a reality television show launched called Leave It to Lamas, starring oh Lorenzo Lamas and his immediate family, including his fame-hungry children, which this was apparently just them trying to get roles and 
being fake reality TV is really what it was. Just generally nasty. They were like vile people. Katie was like, their family's awful. And she apparently watched the whole thing. It was only on for one scene. <laughs> so nobody watched I mean, the show. I she's the completist it. for sure. When Once she starts, she's not stopping until yeah. it's over. Apparently, Lorenzo also wasn't on speaking terms with his son, AJ, who was in the show, because he believed that AJ slept with his fourth wife, Shauna Sam. <laughs> oh, shit. I wonder if that's true. <sighs> I, I hope, hope so. so. Oh, yeah, well, now, Spencer and I both, we hope there's some really <laughs> devious stuff going on in the Lamas family. Apparently, I could see it because they're all shitheads. Now, AJ, by the way, I looked at him. I saw him because I saw a little clip of stuff. Looks like Lorenzo Lamas and Renegade. Spot on, same face. It's kind of creepy. Good it's a him. shame that more and more casting directors are requiring you to be able to act. <laughs> <laughs> what a pity. A final note here on Lamas's career. In the late 2000s, roles started to dry up a bit for him, and he wasn't quite getting the attention he wanted, so he decided to embark on a different kind of career. And much like another syndicated star that we discussed previously on the show, Kevin Sorbo, Lamas started not only taking shitty movie roles in like B-movies, but also Godsploitation movies as well. He was in something oh, called wow. WWJD, The Journey Continues. <laughs> and, of course, God's Club, which we've seen, Brian yes. and I have seen. So he was in a, a couple of those. When talking to Katie about that reality show, I think he's kind of like a poser Christian and that he doesn't really... Like, Kevin Sorbo's the re real deal. He, he believes believed it. He's Jesus. -y. I think Lamas does it. He believes he's it. Jesus. Kevin Sorbo believes That's he's actually Jesus. That's actually more accurate. Yeah. yeah. I think Lamas is more just wants to be part of the party and have yeah. some roles. Now, he's very conservative. Well, and also, if you were the lead in a series in 1992, you're required to appear in God's exploitation film. Pretty much at this point. So I thought that was fascinating. It, that, is, uh, it is really, somebody. really interesting that's what direction he went. I liken turning to God's exploitation movies and TV as when one of your favorite bands from 1997 yeah. is playing the State Fair. <laughs> yeah, so that's pretty accurate. I wonder why the the people who are cosmetically pleasing are doing the Christian movies. Are we saying that Christianity is shallow in that sense? Because <laughs> well, I'm wondering I'm wondering why it's so easy for them to transition to that role and why the Christian audience receives them so well. Well I will say this. Okay, so Christians are I, shallow. I see I see your point because the Christians have managed to acquire Dean Kane, Kevin Sorbo, Lorenzo Lamas. Corbin but Burnson. This is sort of this is <laughs> Corbin Burnson, yes, also all at some point, some sort of hunky dreamboat types. Mm -hmm. <laughs> However, this is a lot like when a sports team acquires a veteran past his prime to fill a role, because we're no longer seeing ripply muscle of <laughs> Kevin Sorbo. We're seeing just kind of a... Yeah, he's hobbling. He's a little loose and hobbly. He's, yeah. got the, he's got the house limp. Yeah, he has the house <laughs> limp. Dean Cain has eaten a lot of pudding. <laughs> There's just a lot going on. He actually does that in most of his roles. There's a scene in every movie where he's just devouring pudding because they couldn't get it out of his hands. He just kept going at it. It, the, it alternates with scenes where he is <laughs> shuffling papers and shaking his head. <laughs> and just a little annoyed yeah. at whatever's going on. Also in Renegade is Branscombe Richmond as Native American bounty hunter and friend of Reno Reigns, Bobby Sixkiller, which Bobby Sixkiller is somehow the more normal name between that and Branscombe Richmond. Yeah. What a name. Also, uh, we'll get more into this, but Bobby Sixkiller is totally my favorite character in Renegade. Yeah. I love how they just casually say like, oh, you mean Mr. Sixkiller? <laughs> and the show where it's, it's, like, it's so people great. People act like it's just the name someone has. Yep, and Richmond has been in a ton of stuff, including Walker, Texas Ranger, Nash Bridges, Forgetting Sarah Marshall, and what? Chicago Med. <laughs> and he is still active to this day. That He has Good. several films that are in uh, post-production. Good for you. Now, we also have Stephen J. Cannell, the I, creator I, of the I'd show. I'd like to back up just really briefly on, a, what's, what's his name? Branscombe Richmond, mm -hmm, that's <laughs> the it. actor who plays Bobby Sixkiller. I would just like to really quickly throw in a side in that the grindcore band Anal Cunt has a song titled Brans, Branson Richmond. What it brands come Richmond. <laughs> Anal Clay Cunt Shaw did that, Shaw. huh? Yes, Anal Cunt. Huh, we they might paid have to tribute to, that. to him. Maybe I'll write that down and put it somewhere <laughs> in here, like a bumper. That or sounds something like a really good Boop Two Boys blog right there that you could talk yeah. about there. I, I'd be fascinated <laughs> to hear more information about that. You could review their discography. And yeah, don't it. please do. Just Google Anal Cunt. No, you're gonna want to. <laughs> bad results on put that one. Band in there. <laughs> Now, we also have Stephen J. Cannell, the creator of the show, actually acting as well. He plays the villainous <laughs> Donald Dutch Dixon, 
who's the corrupt cop that caused Reno Reigns to become a renegade. He has fun with it too. He sure does. He actually auditioned around 15 people for the role of Dutch Dixon before Lorenzo Lamas suggested Cannell himself should play the villain, and that's just what they ended up doing. Now, Cannell has had his meaty grubs in pretty much every conceivable show out there, every single one that has ever existed. He's written for tons of stuff, including Silk Stockings. Yeah. Oh, wow. Two boys' favorite. Wow. Wise Guy, my mom's favorite. The greatest American hero that, who could it be? Believe it or not, it's yeah. just me. That show. Hardcastle and McCormick, which I think was a cop show. And Spencer, he was the producer who let Johnny Depp out of his contract on 21 Jump Street. Wow. Same also guy. co-creator of 21 yes. Jump Street. Yeah. This is amazing. I he, love uh, how it's all coming full I circle. I believe he co-created both that series and this one. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, no, he's what a, a big deal. Should, should he be proud at this point? No. <laughs> also, these shows are not very similar. 21 Jump <laughs> no. Street and Renegade. That's a good point, yeah. Well, our finally for our last of the core cast, we have Kathleen Kenmont, who plays Bobby Six Killer's sister Cheyenne. <laughs> And we won't actually see Pour her one out. in either of these episodes. I cannot, I cannot, you, every time you say Bobby Sixkiller, I cannot Giggle. help but laugh. Yeah. <laughs> it's, so, just, it's, it's so great. It's a ridiculous also, name. he just rules. He does. <laughs> yeah, I, I do like Bobby Sixkiller. <laughs> so I can't even say it. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's seriously, like it's, it's like you're saying John Smith, but you're saying Bobby Sixkiller instead. <laughs> oh, guys, I, I'm having my friend over tonight. His name is Bobby Sixkiller. <laughs> How many of us are going to be there? Oh, no. Yeah, uh, if I could get a uh, one just pepperoni. And what do you guys want? Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay, extra cheese and uh, bacon and then Philly steak on this next one, okay? All right. Yeah, you're going to want to put that under six killer. <laughs> <laughs> as far as Kenmont goes, again, we won't see her in either of these episodes, but you're really not missing out on anything here. She just so happened to be Lorenzo Lamas's wife at the time of casting the show. And Lamas convinced Cannell to give her the role of Cheyenne because he was worried about being on the road so much and that might hurt their relationship. They divorced sometime during the fourth season, and because Lamas thought she was jealous of his new girlfriend, he convinced Cannell to fire her from the show, and therefore she was Classy. removed going into the fifth season. Man. Now, this led to a really funny moment because I happened to watch the pilot of Renegade. I just wanted to see what it was. Of course. And so it's Reno Reigns and his wife. She's alive at this point. This is before the narrative or the narrator tells us what's going on. Oh. And the beginning of the episode is essentially them just kind of making out on the beach. She's in a bikini. He's in swim trunks That's surfing. hot. Continue. Except neither actor, it's pretty clear, neither actor is comfortable doing physical scenes together. And Katie and I were joking that it's because, what's her name? The girlfriend is probably off screen staring daggers at them. And they, in fact, when they kiss the two characters, they don't actually ever kiss. They kind of rub their faces into <laughs> each other's cheeks. Which is more alarming to me. I feel like it if, was I, jarring. if I was the partner of someone in a make-out roll-around scene, and I'm standing there watching it, which I probably wouldn't be on set, because I wouldn't be on the show, because I'm not an actor. <laughs> but if I that was... That wouldn't stop anybody here. <laughs> yeah, that's true. If I was, I think I'd be like, look, honey, lean into it. Just... <laughs> Give them all yeah. you got. I mean, right? it's a show. It's your. It's you, not real. You're following your dream. You're an actor. Yeah, not uh, Kathleen Kenmont, no. though. Guest stars on the show were many and varied, as you're about to see in our two mm -hmm. episodes. Puffy faced, usually, though. <laughs> so I'm going to give you a list of some of the famous guest stars who were on Renegade, starting with Leia Remini. That's right, Doug Heffernan's wife. She guest starred on an episode of Renegade. We also have MLB's home run leader, Barry Bonds, making a guest <laughs> appearance as like a mechanic, which was amazing. Go check that out. Melora Hardin, a.k.a. Jan from The Office. She was on the show. Hold on. I'm still picturing Barry Bonds like wielding a wrench. <laughs> I'm trying to think of Barry Bonds as Flash McGuire and Hey Dude. <laughs> that would have like, been a lot more convincing. <laughs> yeah. The Crushing ultimate, them. Ultimate swap out. Jackie Earl Haley was in the show. He he was in the, what, uh, Watchmen as Rorschach. He was in a, Little Children. Little Children, all kinds of movies. Uh, yeah. he, he was in that Friday the 13th reboot, I think. Something like that. He was, what, Freddy Krueger? I That's believe Friday he was, 13th, right? because he looks like Robert England. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> Michael J. White, another, oh, um, yeah. I guess, martial artist, was yes. on the show. good for him. Danny Trejo. We all know Danny Trejo. He Machete. Was on Sugar Ray Leonard, the world's most famous boxer. You know, he just happened to be in Renegade <laughs> for some reason. Oh, they got some serious talent on this thing. And like I said, a couple more coming up here, so we'll get into them in a bit. Actually, you know what? Let's just get into the episode. It's time to talk about it. So once again, this is Season Ooh, 4, boy. Episode 22, The Road Not Taken. 
You know, it's a little bit of a wistful peek into the different avenues that life might have in store for us. You know, it's some excellent storytelling, right, guys? It is storytelling. A, yeah. <laughs> a story was told. You know, the show opens with a haunting bit of calliope music <laughs> and some circus bullshit. And before long, the twang of guitar breaks through as old man Johnny Cash appears. <laughs> Fumbling around, just kind of falling forward. Waddles his way under the scene. Strangely, like, what, 10, 20 years away from his death? Like he's, Somehow. He had all that time left I, after this show. Watching this, I would guess 10, 20 minutes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he did not look good. He had gray hair, a denim he did jacket. Not, yeah. He had his bulbous, throbbing, red, drunk old man nose. He, you know, he had that nose. Okay, is that what life, causes yeah. the nose? Because no, his nose was always like that. His was like that, it, but it, it does happen. Old men, get, there's something called old man nose, and as a large-nosed man, I'm concerned about this as I age, that I might get one of those big Rudolph noses that just turns red and purple and has big pores. <laughs> red and purple. Do you know what I'm talking you, about? Yes, because it's what I call old drunk man nose. I, yeah. Yes, I think you're just going to get it because of your nose. <laughs> I'm worried about it. But a lot of, that is a thing. Like yeah. That is a symptom of... of alcohol abuse is you get that red yeah, loaded nose. Yeah, and it's nose. just this huge nose. But you're right though, the pores are just nose. massive. You can see them, they're craters. And it's just, it looks like a potato. <laughs> But yeah, seriously, he you, you should look. He always had a strange nose. He did, yes. Yeah. yeah, and I'm sure it did get exaggerated. Was he a drinker? I didn't oh, yeah. really know. I think oh, he was yeah. an everythinger. He did a lot of cocaine, a lot of drinks, a lot of, <laughs> lot of stuff. Well, the, the nose would have been good for cocaine. <laughs> He's like, been everywhere, <laughs> that's man. A good point, yeah. Him and his bloated face are clearly trying to get away from someone. Now, who could be chasing Johnny Cash, you ask? Well, we're given the answer as a motorcycle comes flying up on the walkway <laughs> in this frightening nighttime circus. And Lorenzo Lamas and his glorious hair is on full display, and he has a shotgun. Now, bounty hunter Reno Reigns is hot on old man Cash's trail, and he <laughs> wanders through some dirty structure looking for his mark when, bam, Johnny Cash smashes the much younger, much more agile, much larger, and much cooler man square in the stomach with a plank. Renegade's gun goes flying off into the dirt, and the two tussle for a bit until Reno gets the upper hand. He proceeds to bash the 64-year-old man's head repeatedly <laughs> into the ground when finally the foe shows up. And I looked it up. He was 64. In this and it took, it took Reno a lot of effort to take down old man puffy face Johnny Cash. Mm -hmm. And to me, I'm still jarred at this point because Van alluded to an episode we were going to cover that we did not cover called Honor Bound. And I watched that episode before we kind of changed directions. That episode also features a diminutive old man just beating the living shit out of everyone that encounters his path. And he is more of a... A man just shaped like a Lego. I just <laughs> he built was a real solidly. Man. So I understood it a bit more, even if, again, in his 50s for sure, taking out all comers. But it was so jarring because there were no less than five fight scenes with this old man beating the hell out of someone in that And episode. he was pretty convincing, like throwing around spinning back fists and stuff. <laughs> more convincing than some of the fights we see in the show. Certainly sure. the Johnny Cash ones, who, again, yeah. it looks, <laughs> he looks like a stuffed animal in the dryer. <laughs> <Whatever>. <laughs> Yeah. Whenever he's like, kind of like physically running into people in this, and his episode. hairs like, get a little wild because yeah. any exertion <laughs> causes him to sweat. Now the cops show up, and Renegade <laughs> says, "Oh, gee whiz, fellas, you came just in time." He continues saying, "I'm Vince Black," which, by the way, can't go by his real name, Reno Rain, so he goes by the bounty hunter yes. name Vince Black. That's his pseudonym, which is in not the show. as ridiculous as Somehow. Reno Rains. He's a bounty hunter working for Six Killer Enterprises, <laughs> and this here is Henry Travis. Now, Henry Travis is a bail jumper on trial for assault with intent down in San Luis, and Reno's got somewhere to be. So if it's all the same to them, just mail his bounty hunter <laughs> check to the address on his bounty hunter business card. The cop grins and says, yeah, sure, that's fine. Except you do got somewhere to be, son. My jail, Reno Reigns. Oh, no. What? I thought that they were going to arrest Henry Travis. Well, he arrests them both. He draws what a travesty. his weapon. travesty. And look, Reno Reigns has spent four years on the lamb from the cops, yet this looks like it's it. There's no way Vince Black can get out of this one. No. The scene fades, and we see the ghostly dark visage of Reno Reigns motoring down the lonesome highway with a crimson sunset fading in the background. And it's possibly the best intro segment in the history of the Boob Two Boys. It's so good. Walker gets points for me because he sings the song. This one gets points for me because of just how fat I am. This intro is better than Walker, though. It's more prolonged. It has mm -hmm. that stupid the voiceover. voiceover. And it has, uh, can I, would you guys mind if I just mentioned a few things? Sure, go for it. These are just. I have some more for these you. These are too. out of context. <laughs> these are just things in the intro I noticed. 
charging dogs, mm -hmm. whirring machinery, <laughs> at least one rattlesnake, <laughs> spoken word narration, obviously, multiple water jugs, one dumped on Lorenzo Lamas, intercut of action plus babes in steam. <laughs> and then my favorite thing that I have, okay, so Van knows this. I have long found it inexplicably hilarious, the gag of shaking someone's hand and then pulling your hand back to brush your hair back. Mm -hmm. And Bobby Sixkiller does this during the credits, and I did a fist pump by myself. Yeah, I giggled uproariously because of how good it was, too. <laughs> I'm so glad you found the gif of that, too. I was thinking Yeah, and he has such one. a shit-eating grin when he does it. The whole intro segment's great. I do particularly love the jug of water pouring over his shirtless head. <laughs> well, he's and hot. When we were watching that, Katie looked at it and she goes, no, Reno Reigns, that's not how you drink. <laughs> and I could also see Was Lorenzo she able Lama's to contain abused. herself with all these hunks around? No, no chance. Let's just say we had to put a towel down if she was watching <laughs> that show. After the intro, we find ourselves back at the police precinct and both Johnny Cash and Reno Reigns, are and by the way, I'm just going to call him Johnny Cash. I'm not going with yeah. Henry Travis. Yeah, it's fine. It's the same name anyway. <laughs> <laughs> they are getting their mug shots taken and their fingerprints as well. Now, in the jail cell, we find that Reno and Johnny Cash have been chained to each other's ankles for some reason. I guess that's how they do it and not San Luis, because I guess he escaped there. Either way, Renegade looks pissed. We see the arresting officer puts in a phone call and asks for Donald Dutch Dixon, who again is the series' main villain, Dixon is ecstatic that this cop got the man he's been after for four years, and now he's going to be on a plane to California that night to collect his prize. This Ooh. is not good news for Reno Reigns, Vince Black, Renegade Lamas. Not good <laughs> news at all. In the cell, Johnny Cash asks Reno what, he, what the hell he did, which made him such a big fish anyway, and Reno says that he was framed. Johnny has a good laugh about that, but he does know something's wrong with our renegade hero and continues to press. I, I actually kind of thought his line of w when Reno says, I didn't do anything, and Johnny Cash says, I committed a nothing in three states. Mm -hmm. It's kind of funny. Kind yeah, of funny. Yeah, chuckle. He also says something about their, like, good thing you're not in prison in Alabama and, and trails Florida? off. Yeah. And I feel like there was a butt penetration implication. <laughs> a Johnny Cash butt penetration yeah. implication. Reno, of course, at this point says, I'm thinking I wish I were dead. It's the way oh, he read right. that line. This is the great thing here where Johnny Cash steps in as psychologist and says, For the first no time. one, no one wishes they were dead. Mm -hmm. Like, he's got the insight there. This is also the first time that Reno, it, I, I cannot for the life of me understand it, really deeply confides in Johnny Cash. <laughs> yeah. No matter what circumstances going on. I like how you on. said the first time because it happens over and over again. Over and over episode. again, no matter if they're getting along or not. And <laughs> to, to his credit, Johnny Cash is always quite receptive. Yeah, he's he's a father figure psychologist, I guess. This scene Reno. of it has a Reno line that I just, I really loved also when he's talking to Johnny Cash and it just kind of breaks down when Johnny Cash is trying to comfort him and says, how do you know what I wish? <laughs> <laughs> it's, I, I wrote down that he gets uh, animated at Cash. <laughs> he explains what happened is that his wife is dead thanks to him. Cash argues back, of course, with Reno and tells him that even though he's thought about committing suicide, he found out what happens when I'm looking down the barrel of guns, son. <laughs> he has that weird vibrato yeah, at it's every a constant moment. Quaver. And he realized when looking down the barrel of that gun, I want to live. <laughs> the jailer saunters his way over to the cell, bragging about having caught a big-time celebrity cop killer. But what that cop didn't count on is the lightning-quick reflexes of a drunk 70-year-old <laughs> man whose body has been ravaged by years of drug abuse. And before he knows it, Cash has the cop in a chokehold. Reno snags his keys and unlocks the cell door. I didn't see the cop tap. He did. He went down. Oh, okay. Well, maybe, no, that's why he went down. He didn't tap out. Yeah. So he was... He's he too was, tough to tap out. They had to pipe in the I quit sound <laughs> to, wait to make it an official win for Johnny Cash here. <laughs> Cash's powerful grasp ends up causing the cop to collapse. <laughs> and both Cash and Reno bolt out the door and jump on Renegade's motorcycle, narrowly escaping a hail of gunfire from I, the other two cops. My favorite part is before they really kick it into gear, they're just slowly walking out of jail. Well, Cash can't move that quickly. No. It was a, it was a surprisingly easy jail escape. Very, very <laughs> the, simple. For the a cop cops, killer? The cops, too, only went so far, and there, it's like an invisible boundary that was drawn, yeah. and they had to shoot from that line. Oh, it's lava past like, that line! <laughs> yeah. They're like, oh, they're getting away. We'll fire our ineffective pistols at them as they go. You know, it's like a... It was a seriously very misguided scene where they're supposed to be 
usually wanted criminals that are on the run. The cops are like, damn it. <laughs> oh, I just remembered we're in Renegade. Let's just stand here and fire into the sky. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, if they were cops, they're getting minimum wage and getting shot at. Yeah, they so just, they're like, it ah, wasn't I'm worth not putting it. effort in. Like, let's let Johnny Cash go. Well, let's <laughs> let Johnny Cash go and that guy who kills cops. It's fine. It's no big deal. <laughs> we then hear the unmistakable twang of Johnny Cash's hit Sing a Traveling Song. We get to witness. Oh like, man, I love that. Yeah. They had to play a Johnny Cash song mm-hmm. during this part. That was... It's like a backdoor version of the thing <laughs> we're used to, where the star of the show sings the theme song. That's true. If you think about it, that it's way, a real yeah. power move to be to ride a motorcycle while your own song plays. <laughs> Although less of a power move when you're closely grasping another man's waist. Oh, he's snuggled. Real, a man forty real years close. your junior. And that's exactly what we get. We get to see old man Johnny Cash riding with Lorenzo Lamas as they drive a modest rate of speed down the highway. <laughs> they were not going very quickly, but yeah, Cash is. It hardly on screams him. prison break. <laughs> <laughs> in the middle of their song and travel montage, though, we see the two decide to stop in a random park and they argue for a bit. <laughs> the dialogue basically amounts to Renegade still intends to turn in Johnny Cash to the fuzz, despite his helping Reno escape. Horrible and despite fate. giving him psychological advice, mm-hmm. this is where I started thinking: like, can this just be a road trip movie with Johnny Cash and it Reno? Was. I, I it, wanted honestly, it, I wanted it to take its own <laughs> life here and just go that way. I wanted them <laughs> them to take over the entire plot. Renegades mm-hmm. tried to break new ground here and said, "What if we had?" like a two-hander road trip movie, (laughs) but neither one of them can act. (laughs) (laughs) Now, Reno handcuffs Cash to the motorcycle, and away they go. We get to hear Sing a Traveling Song (laughs) once again. We find out Reno's taking Cash to Bobby Six Killer's place by the docks, but right away something's a little amiss. Oh, you mean the Six Killer Enterprises headquarters? (laughs) Yeah, you know, on the docks and... Yeah. Wait, where are they? I guess they're in California, so maybe they're by the base, San Diego. Okay, makes a little bit of sense. Six Killer Enterprises, of course, used to be there, but now there's a swimsuit store. Yeah, Victoria's Bikini Hut. <laughs> How successful can your shop be if you only sell that? Just swimsuits? Can I please really quickly interject? Sure. That in, on the trip, Johnny Cash is complaining about being hungry. <laughs> he does. Multiple like, times in the episode. Can we stop real fast and get us some grub? You know, something like that. So I actually put a note here. Johnny Cash is really hungry. <laughs> He's like, well, it ain't going to do us no good getting arrested on an empty stomach. <laughs> <laughs> my insulin level's killing me. I gotta get something in my belly. So I put down, what is his favorite meal? And then I looked it up. What is and it? And now oh. I know. It's I know. Biscuits Johnny and gravy Cash's, or something. <laughs> you're, you're close. You're, gonna, you're not going to be surprised by any of this because we know what kind of person Johnny Cash was, especially geographically Raccoon speaking. Raccoon meat yeah. and grits. <laughs> so n- number one is chili. He likes the iron pot okay. chili. He also, the rest of the stuff, guys, is just, is, I, c- I couldn't make this up. <laughs> Pineapple pie? <laughs> What the hell is that pineapple real? pie? That sounds <laughs> awful. It's acidic. Like no. <laughs> Let's get those spikes. <laughs> fried okra, of course. Okay, yes. I like I like. Of course, okra. cornbread. Of yeah, course. That yeah. again, that's that Comfort southern thing. Food. Yeah, cornbread and okra. Home style. Peanut butter cookies. Okay. okay. That's yeah. it. He he likes all that kind of like he he was a big sweets guy apparently. Sure. Home so, so, couldn't tell by man. shame. <laughs> and the, yeah, just <laughs> anything anything southern he did. Again, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what a pineapple pie is, but he did like it. I want to also point out real quick before you continue with this. I don't know why this triggered this memory, but Richard Nixon really liked ketchup on his cottage cheese. <laughs> oh, oh, no wonder he was such a fucking asshole. He's a monster. Yeah, <laughs> not only for his awful deeds, but for eating that. Yeah, yeah. Oh. He had like a whole breakfast ritual. I I wrote this down here. Let me find it real fast. Get me my ketchup. <laughs> Yeah, like, wow, well, no, we're going to be in Vietnam forever. Hold on, I want my Heinz. <laughs> this is fascinating. I don't know why I got in this thing, but I, I just kept I kept going when it was like, what's everyone's favorite meal? Richard Nixon, in the mornings, he would just get up, you know, just casually, he's Richard Nixon. He would I'm get, mad. <laughs> he'd have orange juice, half a grapefruit, cold cereal, skim milk, and coffee. And then later in the day, and this, is, this is a big feast. Yeah, yeah. that's so much food. <laughs> <laughs> later in the day, probably like two hours later, <laughs> he would have cottage cheese. This is controversial. Not everyone believes it's true, but one of his favorite toppings for the cottage cheese was to just ketchup over it. That's just disgusting. So I, I'm, this is this is the thing. This is in there. Hmm. This is in the... <laughs> the Richard Nixon Museum. <laughs> yes, somewhere. This was all part of the Watergate report. So that's uh, that's some favorite foods, and now we can get back to the episode about Six Killer. Wow. <laughs> Well, at this point, Reno goes up to the sexy swimsuit saleswoman intending to figure out what happened here. 
I would be remiss if I didn't point out a couple of things in this There's scene. actually, yeah, yeah. There's a lot to point out. Number one, the women are working at a swimsuit store, which doesn't seem like they're trying to sell the product. Venture. Yeah. They are what wearing the supposedly swimsuits. Those are just bras. Those aren't even swimsuits. Yeah. It looks a little like Baywatch at that point. <laughs> yeah, I could see that. I guess it was about the same time, maybe. Maybe rubber bands is what they were made of. Could be. In addition to that, it's pretty clear that a lot of these women were not chosen for their acting ability because you see them in the backgrounds of scenes staring, unflinching, <laughs> unblinking. I thought some of them were mannequins. They're not. They're real people. <laughs> I think the only requirement was, can you wear a bikini well? Yes. Do you and have then, boobs? Yeah. D yes? Okay, you're hired. <laughs> I will push back a little bit on you saying they were not hired for their acting ability and ask, who on Renegade was? Yeah. Good point. Johnny not, Cash. I, <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, he's the one. Arena finds out via the lady of swimsuits that Bobby Sixkiller <laughs> hasn't had a business here in years. In fact, there was a whole kerfuffle I was a couple so of years ago. I was right now. It's like, what's going on? Between Cheyenne and Bobby, they had the Battle of the Six Killers, again, their brother sister. Bobby eventually went to work for some bigwig police officer. And Reno's, of course, puzzled by this and asks who the cop is. The swimsuit lady points to a local newspaper and says, him. Renegade takes one peek at the Bay City Ledger and sees that his old nemesis, Dutch Dixon, is running for mayor. And with Six Killer in tow, that can't be true. Something is amiss here. And look, Johnny Cash is complaining about his insulin levels. I wrote that down. I got to know it here. <laughs> and the uh, two motorcycle off to a local diner. He probably hasn't had really... a pineapple pie in weeks at this point. <laughs> He's starving. He doesn't have one in his rucksack. <laughs> I also really, really enjoyed the fact that the Bikini Woman and Lorenzo Lamas have to try and figure out if they're talking about the same guy yeah. when talking about Bobby Sixkiller. And the woman is forced to describe him, at Bobby Sixkiller, as always wearing a fluorescent sport coat. <laughs> which is not wrong based on what we see in no, the next episode. True. This one's a little different. This which one you'll he looks understand. fucking good, but we'll get to it. Damn good. Yeah. He's, he's very suave. Now at the diner, Reno can't find Bobby or Cheyenne in the phone book. Because remember, this is the 90s. Phone books were a thing and necessary. They were all the rage, which was also popular in the 90s, <laughs> to say that. He does get a great idea to call that newspaper, though, the one that wrote the article about Dutch Dixon. And it was a scathing editorial on the man and how he's corrupt. Reno finds out Dixon's holding a press conference on some random street corner. And the author of the article, Lisa Corcoran, is there. Renegade and Cash find their way to the press conference as Lisa, the reporter's grilling Dutch Dixon about some old skeletons in his closet. <laughs> Possibly literal. <laughs> but Dixon is steadfast that his time as police chief shows a drop in crime rate, and that shows how great of a mayor he is. I'm not here to talk about the past or how evil I am. This is like a Trump news conference 20 years before Trump was giving news <laughs> yeah. conferences. Fake news. Yeah, just screaming yeah. and yelling. Uh, I'm irritated that all the horrible things I've done have come to roost. <laughs> After some back and forth, Dixon finishes the press conference and Lisa angrily storms off. Reno catches up to her and tries in vain to explain that he knows both Dixon and Six Killer and that he was involved in an internal sting against Dixon from years ago. She does what any excellent reporter would do. She hears this information that give her a breakthrough in the story and she says, piss off, dude, I don't care. <laughs> uh, I've been working on this with every fiber of my being mm -hmm. and it's my true passion in life to bring the light of the truth to the American public, but <laughs> you have a break in the case? Nah, no, nah, we good. need to drag this out to 42 minutes. <laughs> so just then Reno and Lisa are jumped by a couple of goons, including Bobby <laughs> Sixkiller, and Reno excitedly tries to talk to him. That's his best friend. Yeah, and he his says that, he's like, friend, we're BFFs. <laughs> he's met with surprise and confusion though. Now why would the best friend of Reno Reigns be resorting to goonery and threatening this journalist while also not having a clue who Reno is. And why would he be wearing a tailored suit and awesome sunglasses? <laughs> There's a whole fight scene here, too, where Reno and the goons slowly flail at one another. This is the first really bad fight scene yeah. we see. They subdue Reno and Six Killer while smoking a stogie. Tells oh, Reno, that's the biggest cigar I've ever huge. seen. Yeah. He tells Reno, look, I don't know you, and if you ever lay his eyes on you again, it'll be the last time. He oh, And the camera is from Reno's though. perspective, by the way. And Six Silver flicks his cigar ashes onto it's the It's another big time power move from evil version of Bobby Six Killer, who they really should have given a goatee. <laughs> yes, they should have, now that I think <laughs> about it. So that ends the scene. It cuts out, fades to black. What's going on here, guys? Confused and defeated, Reno heads back to his hog. And Johnny Cash <laughs> says, Oh, you sure look like you went five rounds with a hurricane, son. <laughs> I, and by the way, I have <laughs> clips from the show, all, too many of them, 
I had to cut some clips because I just had too many. So a lot of these phrases I'd love to put in here, but it's it's too much. This is another awesome scene where Lorenzo Lamas really, really confides in Johnny Cash mm -hmm. too. And and he just doesn't know. He doesn't know what's going on. His world has sort of come to an end at this point. Well, and he talks to Cash, and Cash says, hey, are you taking me directly to jail? To have their little conversation about what's actually going on right now. Well, I don't see what's so damn funny. You got your wish, Reno. What wish? The one you made last night, don't you remember? You said you'd wish that you would taken that bullet instead of your little bride-to-be. It's been four years since Dutch and Hogg took you out. Four long years since Dutch and Hogg <laughs> took you down. I would down. hate to be taken anywhere by Dutch and Hogg. Ooh, and Hogg was, he was in that pilot episode. He was a big <laughs> boy. He was kind of gross, too. Now we know what's really going yeah, on. Yeah, there's here. a genie and it grants wishes. <laughs> Reno, of course, doesn't believe this. Why would anyone believe this? He's too streetwise to know that this is because a kind of magic that could go down. Can't get that past Reno Reigns. And the two ride their way back to that same diner from earlier, and we get one of the most confusing Johnny Cash lines from this whole show for me. Good Lord, those cops in Conquest must have shot me. How do you figure? Fear and us in the restroom under one roof. <laughs> must have died and went to heaven. No, you're uh, you're still very much alive. Has he never been in a, he does, what? Uh, uh, ice and booze, I've never seen that combination before. I drink my nasty beer tepid. <laughs> hey Johnny, let's, how about you just freestyle for this scene? <laughs> That's fine, I guarantee I have something relatable that a human would say. <laughs> no one's been around <laughs> toilets before. And I've been toilets. everywhere, man. <laughs> I've been everywhere. At the bar, we're treated to a skeevy little stereotype of a man named Tony. <laughs> And he is a sight to behold with his bald head, Hawaiian shirt buttoned way too low, chest hair bursting out, four foot six inch stature. We're told immediately that Tony has some connection to the Bounty Hunters Guild or whatever it is. And Reno needs answers. So Tony's going to give him some. Of course, Tony doesn't work for free. No. $100 later though, he's ready to dish. And this is $100 in like 1993 money. So that's pretty good. I mean, it's, it's probably like, a lot of money probably like $200 now. or something. It's an expensive <laughs> consultation. You don't just get his services. Now, Tony and Reno have a couple of beers and we find out that back in 92 when all this started, instead of being redeemed via Reno, Bobby Sixkiller got a little rough with his bail skipper and the guy dies while being apprehended. Facing jail time for murder, Dixon steps in at the last minute and gets Sixkiller cleared but now Dixon owns Six Killer. <laughs> what? This is a real bummer for what happened Sucks. to Bobby Six Killer in this alternate timeline of Renegade. He became Dixon's hired assassin. This whole episode basically serves to say, whew, good thing Val's dead. <laughs> <laughs> now Reno asks about Cheyenne again, his sister, and Tony tells him that something bad went down. Apparently she didn't like what was happening to her brother, so she confronted Six Killer and it didn't end well. She threatened to turn him into the, quote, real law which is what Tony says there, and Bobby ended the Texas up Rangers. hurting her. It doesn't end there, though. The whole situation was so bad that Cheyenne ended up yeah. killing herself. He oh, didn't man. kill her. It was even worse. Mm, That's even how he worse. says it. Even worse, she killed herself. Can't get to heaven if you kill yourself. I mean, there's obviously no right answer here, and, uh, you know, we've all three been in some dark places, but I'm just going to say... Is it better to have been murdered by your brother than to die by your own hand? Because that's kind of what the implication is there. Yeah, no, I, I would think that your sibling not committing murder would be better, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty bad when, when someone murders someone, generally speaking. <laughs> now it's here that Reno's finally had enough and he goes off the rails. Oh yeah, he does a whole thing. Like the, the bar is like, what the fuck is this guy doing? He just gets up and Winning screams, an Emmy is what well, he's I'm doing. I'm glad you're all in on this joke. The Truman <laughs> Show that I'm in. You know, like. All right. Where are you going? This stupid charade has gone on far enough. What charade? Everybody, you want to see me squirm? Take a good look, okay? I'm squirming. My skin is crawling. <laughs> so everybody put away your candid cameras and come on <laughs> out. I don't know what you're talking about. Your candid cameras. <laughs> yeah, you know, Reno's familiar with candid camera. Uh, Smile. You're on candid camera. Now, I did want to play a two minute clip here, but there's one other excellent line in this conversation that I wanted to say at the end of it. Reno says to Tony, don't you patronize me, you little shrimp. Oh, I put that down. <laughs> it's so Yeah, good. it's like, it's obvious the entire time that this guy's tiny and you just think, oh, that's nice of Reno not to point that out. And then at the end, he's like, fuck you, you little shrimp. He does. <laughs> you know, he just calls him out. Now Reno splits from Tony and walks the four feet back over to Johnny Cash, who's wheezing at the bar. And the two <laughs> work through what's going on with Reno saying, if Cash is right, and Reno did get his wish to eat that bullet way back when, mm -hmm. he's got a surefire way to find out if that's the case. 
Reno takes Cash to the police precinct, and we find his buddy Sergeant Bickford, who has been in several episodes. I think he was in like 15 or so, so he's a recurring character. He's a series regular. We know who he is if we watched Renegade. <laughs> and we did not previously. No. I do now. Now, Sir, <laughs> Sergeant Bickford also has no idea who Reno is. Oh, I love this part. They they do a really outdated pop culture reference. Which one was it? He's trying to he's trying to book him, and he's like, "I don't know who you are. Is this an American Express commercial?" That's right. Like yeah. I was like, "What what are we talking about here?" I forgot all about. <laughs> is those this ads. a 1993 American <laughs> Express commercial? <laughs> they totally snuck that in, thinking like, "Oh, people are gonna eat this up." And I don't remember that being an American Express thing. Like identity theft. Who knows? <laughs> Well, Reno turns in Johnny Cash when he realizes the guy doesn't uh, that Bigford doesn't recognize him again. After him. confiding in him as as a best friend mm -hmm. about a hundred more times, times, turns him in. They even flirted a little bit before this, where he <laughs> say, uh, "Johnny Cash says, don't don't ask me to pinch you. You're not my type." <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But pinch me. <laughs> well, here after he turns him in, Cash starts to give him some shit, and he says. Son, I'm going to have a picnic on your grave when I get out. One of two times in this episode that Johnny Cash mentions a picnic, which again lends itself to me thinking he's super hungry. <laughs> Reno, of course, quips back here, fine, I'll bring the beer. Clearly not understanding how graves work. If it's his grave, he's in it. But this does put a thought in Reno's hollow, hollow head. He figures, if I'm dead, where's my grave? And Johnny Cash says something like, well, you're such a good detective, go figure it out. Oh. So Reno does. He heads out to the cemetery where his wife was buried to see if it's now his grave and not hers. We then get to see an absurd shot of Lorenzo Lamas <laughs> riding his motorcycle through a graveyard, all while a melodramatic song plays in the background. There is more time killed by motorcycle riding in this <laughs> show than anything else. Mm -hmm. I, I would argue that it works. <laughs> <laughs> I was kind of hoping he would ride past Rose and Ronnie, or Rosie and Ronnie sitting there oh, yeah. in the Why graveyard. Not? But let's, it wasn't raining, different day. Tie it all in. <laughs> I like to look at stars. <laughs> <laughs> I like to look at stars there, Reno Rain. <laughs> now the camera does pan around a little bit, very, very slowly as Reno approaches a grave and it shows what the show's been telling us all along. It's his grave. Oh no. Oh no. Oh, Marino shit. doesn't get to mourn himself for long because he sees Bobby Six Killer walking up behind the grave. Now, Six Killer wants to invite Reno to a meeting. How long did Bobby Six Killer wait at the cemetery for this to happen? A couple days. Yeah. He, he <laughs> camped out, had a picnic. He was there. He knew to carry his picnic basket with That's him. That's how he graduated from Five Killer, his patience. <laughs> he decides he wants to invite Reno to a meeting, a meeting with Donald Dutch Dixon. Who was standing right behind him the entire time. What a coordinated fair, reveal. Though, if anyone's behind Brandscombe Richmond, you're probably not going <laughs> to see him. He's a big guy. He's 6'3", he's wide. That's true, yeah. he is big. He's a big, I, strong I man. I did wonder when I was watching that scene, like, if they, if you if you were to kind of get outside of the cinematography part of it, where if you were to be the character who's reading the lines, be like, what, what, stop saying your dramatic thing. Who's behind you? <laughs> <laughs> like, just skip that. Like, what? why is that guy? Just peering around a It little. also kind of looks like, it, it almost like Dixon emerges from somebody's private crypt. <laughs> like a mausoleum, yeah. Yeah, it, I also kind of wanted Bobby Sixler to say, ta-da, as he moved out of the way to reveal him. <laughs> you know who. <laughs> <laughs> what? No, seriously, guess who's Does here. The cartwheel off the screen. <laughs> <laughs> like, not even a, like a barrel roll, a straight cartwheel, arms outstretched, the whole thing. He does a whistle and a horse rides up and he just rides off on the horse. Now, as we fade to commercial, I think it's an excellent time to go ahead and fade to commercial break. So stay tuned. When we get back, we'll talk more Renegade. Now, back in the graveyard, Dutch and Reno are discussing what the hell's going on here. And Reno calls out Dutch on his corruption. Dutch asks what it is that Reno wants and Reno tells him that this whole crazy nightmare is true, then that means Dutch murdered him, and he's back now to make him pay. Reno demands that Dutch goes public with the murder, but Dutch has a demand of his own. He says, go back where you came from and never cross my path again, because if you do, I'm going to kill you for real. The second time this, this crime syndicate has <laughs> oh. been like, but next time we'll get you. We give second chances here. And that's where Reno has that really good line, you can't kill a man twice. He says, well, Dutch, 
You can't kill the same man twice. <laughs> it's a legal thing. <laughs> <laughs> double have Jeopardy. you ever seen Double Jeopardy yeah. with Ashley Judd? <laughs> <laughs> we have in the theater yeah. with her mom, which mm -hmm. is a little weird. Was that before this? Because maybe he was referencing that. Could be. It I don't would know have the been a few frame. years after. I believe that movie was released in 1998. Oh man, so it wasn't that. Okay, maybe Double it's Jeopardy. A, was I know based it's on a this. damn shame. There's <laughs> boobs in that movie though. Yeah, they're pretty good. I remember that as a teenage boy. <laughs> uh, Reno rides his motorcycle off into the distance, of as course. he does so often. Reno runs into Johnny Cash at the liquor store in the least surprising event <laughs> in this show, and the two discuss his meeting with Dutch. Reno reveals <laughs> that Dutch let him go, and these two wonder why, coming to the conclusion that he just wasn't afraid of the dead man, but he should be. Reno turns up at the apartment of the journalist Lisa Corcoran and convinces her to help him figure some stuff out while giving her more dirt on Dutch. I love this scene, though, because initially when he's like, can I talk to you? She's like, no. Yeah, again. And just shuts the door instantly. What Which a this one, journalist. This one makes more sense She's since she's at, at home. home. Yeah, yeah, but she doesn't even listen to him at all. <laughs> like, she's willing to kind of be like, I know you came here and asked me this question, but no. <laughs> like, it's not even, he doesn't even get anything out. And she's mm -hmm. like, no, no, I've had enough. Leave me alone. I'm closing the, the vest door. was enough for her to turn him down. <laughs> Now she pulls up some old newspaper articles on Reno's death on her cool fucking 1994 God, I computer. love this. They could yeah. make up anything computers could do back then because no one knew. No one knew. No one had a clue no one what knew. they could do. It was do. like, oh, I bet it could do that. So she was zooming in on articles and looking people up and finding contact information. And it was amazing what she could do on that 90s computer. People are like, can you believe you could look at a newspaper on a computer? <laughs> and find someone's phone number? <laughs> I feel like that there should have been a cool service she was using called like CrimeNet <laughs> on her personal computer. And she could say things like, I've accessed the database. <laughs> I've hacked into it. <laughs> hacked into, yes, exactly. Sandra Bullock is on the other line <laughs> hacking into something. I think that's the second time I've mentioned the net on this podcast. It probably <laughs> is. I, I hope it's not the last. Now, these two talk through everything. When Reno realizes if he's, quote, dead, then his wife must be alive. Lisa gives Reno some information on his wife's address, but the two are interrupted by someone jiggling the door and trying to break into her apartment. <laughs> Reno hides, so as subtle. any tough man would. <laughs> he lets her deal with it. And Bobby Sixkiller bursts of through the door. Of course he does. He's a thug. He continues to threaten Lisa about investigating Dutch, saying don't do this, of course. He also asks about her new friend, Reno Reigns. Now, Renegade lets Six Hiller go on for too long. He assaults <laughs> her for a while, too. Eventually, it's then like he, uh, it, it a way minute, too long. which yeah. doesn't sound like a long time. But it is when you're being his, assaulted. Yeah. He was working up his courage. <laughs> <laughs> he, wasn't, he wasn't trying to do it. Eventually, he clubs Six Kill in the back, in <laughs> incapacitating him long enough for Lisa and Reno to escape. She says, Oh my God, did you hurt him? Because she'd be worried. And he says, like, oh, his head's hard enough. He's okay. Yeah, that's the great line there is uh, he's hard-headed. And also the great thing here is they they leave at that point. They just they, they leave him in a heap on her floor. Mm -hmm. And they decide that we need to figure this shit out. Let's just leave him here. So, and go their separate ways, and, too. <laughs> and he even says, let's get the heck out of here. <laughs> so I put this note. Let's get the heck out of here and leave this very dangerous man unconscious <laughs> and, uh, and unharmed on the floor. Now, in your, in your apartment, yes. You'll <laughs> figure it out later. Who wouldn't want to come back home <laughs> to John? To a dapper Bobby, Bobby six, killer. six Killer. That's true, yeah. Possibly awake now. <laughs> <laughs> it might be better if he's not. If you catch my drift, huh? You could take his teal jewelry. That's what yeah. you can do. I'm not being racist. And by the way, jacket. I could, in this case, this is the one freaking oh, yeah. time That's true. I could be racist. I'm not. He literally wears turquoise stuff Lots in the of series. Turquoise. Like a lot. Now, Reno bikes his way to the address Lisa gave him and hides behind a tree, which is real, just <laughs> funny to me, peering around. Me and the motorcycle. <laughs> How uh, do you know hiding behind a tree doesn't work? Like it, it might. It's true. I guess I haven't done it enough. I'll Hold try. on. I'm going to go try right now. <laughs> you guys see if you can see me. We have oh, one I, tree I, I in the front I'm going to ride my hog behind one. <laughs> I, yeah, the motorcycle sound will give you away. Oh, <laughs> I, I didn't would... even think of that. Now, a van pulls up to the house and outsteps Val, Reno's dead but also not dead wife. <laughs> now, Lorenzo Lamas musters up as much emotion as he can, which is not much, and he tries to look happy but also forlorn. Now, why forlorn? Because Val gets out of the van not only with her new husband, who but is with a her new total baby. stud. Oh, yeah, what a, what a hunk that was <laughs> for sure. He's happy she's alive but also devastated that she moved on. Now, you can't be mad about that. It's four years, he's dead. So he understands it, but he's forlorn. Is any of it just sheer anger that the guy she's with is not wearing a vest with no shirt underneath, and instead he's wearing like a big 80s yuppie sweater and tan pants? Add to that the fact that they're driving a van and not a motorcycle. 
This guy's a piece of shit this in Reno's eyes. This is like the anti-Reno. Now distraught and upset, Reno mopes through the forest. Oh boy. Which, where, where is he? Just some forest. But there's more things in this forest. He's got <laughs> one hand in his pants the whole time when Johnny Cash <laughs> frighteningly appears like the mischievous spirit he is. And he tells Reno that no matter how sad or lonely his renegade life is, what, everything that's going on is going to turn out exactly how it's supposed now, to. At this Man. point, shouldn't Johnny Cash hate Reno? <laughs> As a malevolent spirit, which Who's I guess he is, and knows guys. that Reno can get him some food. That's what's so weird about Johnny Cash's character, because he's clearly some sort of mystical bulbous-nosed sprite or something. <laughs> yeah, he's like he's one of the he's one of the ghosts of Christmas past, yeah. present, future, and <laughs> but Charles has Dickens. very real-world food concerns. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he does need to eat. It's like if if Marley had come and <laughs> and been like, uh, "What's for dinner?" You know, like that that whole scene had been. Let me show you how terrible your life will be if you keep on this way. And also, I'm kind of hungry. <laughs> I need like, a snack. Do you have any pizza rolls? Or like when that family and the others orders Chipotle. <laughs> <laughs> now, Cash tells Reno that if Dutch wins this election, eventually he's going to be headed to Washington. And with that kind of power, he'll be able to do even more damage. I really liked that sequence, too, where he's like, if I win this, then I'm headed to the state. And what if I this? win the state, then I'm headed to Washington. What is and this, if House I win... of Cards? <laughs> yeah, and the guy's already like 53 or something. Mm. Uh, then again, look at politicians. Our president's like 100 years old. You have old. a really good point, man. <laughs> I forgot that we're defying logic in this country in every possible way, typically. Now, Reno whips out his shotgun here, and he reveals that maybe I can do... Oh, sorry, that was too much emotion. Maybe I can do something about that. And then he motorcycles off screen. Yeah, well, yeah. And at this point, I think Johnny Cash has to be concerned that this time he's going to have to shoot a man with Reno just to watch him die. <laughs> I think Johnny Cash is more concerned about his beer nuts because that's what he's <laughs> talked about a lot. I'm disappointed they didn't play any more Johnny Cash songs. It was only one. On these getaways. Which is ironic considering the next episode plays the licensed song they have at minimum three times. <laughs> Reno comes across Dutch at a makeshift homeless soup kitchen, which happens to be in the middle of the street, and he just kind of wanders up to him with his shotgun out. Dutch is always Dutch. doing public appearances when Reno needs to find him. Yeah, it's like he's also, just out and about. It's really funny, like he's got cameras on him and he says, not today, yeah. I'm not campaigning. I'm not I'm, campaigning, this is just, just for me. I'm just here feeding the homeless by myself. <laughs> I didn't want you to Reach your little dirt hand up here and let me scoop some more <laughs> soup into your bucket. <laughs> Throw it in your face. <laughs> Reno's got the gun pointed at Dutch when Bobby Sixkiller shows up pointing a gun at Reno. The two have some snappy. Now, when did he wake up from the apartment where he was knocked out? I wondered. <laughs> a bit ago. Like, I was like, immediately, he's like, I gotta go to the I gotta go fundraiser, check on Dutch. the yeah. homeless fundraiser. I gotta whatever go serve those homeless people. They're hungry. That maybe John, that's why Johnny Cash was in the woods nearby. He was trying to get food at this place. He was in line. Maybe yeah. the evil version of Bobby Sixkiller, there's like a shred of good that has a real passion for helping end world hunger. Dutch yells for Sixkiller to shoot him, and so Sixkiller does. He fires off <laughs> at least 100,000 rounds. In yes. By the way, session. I was really surprised at how quickly he follows out mm -hmm. the order. But of course, the, the we know why. Thing. Bad boy. The great thing is Reno says he's not going to shoot him. He's like, you won't do it. He Why? Because we're such good friends? <laughs> yes. He <laughs> <laughs> just shoots the shit out of him. Not really. And, well, Renegade, I, maybe Bobby Sixclore's that bad of a name. I wouldn't think so. He's a trained assassin. No. Well, Renegade jumps on his bike, takes off, and Dutch yells at Six Killer, how did you miss him? To which our Native American hunk says, it's as if the bullets went right through Whoa. him. Whoa. Oh, shit. As if he's not real. Goosebumps. Wow. Next, Six Killer jumps in his convertible, and we get a renegade-style chase scene with the cops also joining in. The three vehicles weave through traffic, firing bullets just everywhere as they go, and Reno sees his chance to escape and pulls into a nearby carnival. <laughs> as there just are, randomly. This is in my notes. I actually did mention this van when I showed up because I was just glancing over my notes that I had written down, everyone is suddenly running around a carnival. Because there really isn't much of an explanation as to why everyone gets out of their vehicles here. I guess to have fun. I guess, yeah, I mean, you want to win that bear for They might have cash. the crane game or something. <laughs> Desperately trying to escape the cops and six killer, Reno ducks under a nearby roller coaster and blam! He's punched in the face by a bee-denimed man and the two tussle for a moment. With Reno down, we realize that it's Johnny Cash beating the shit out of him. Again, Johnny Cash is so strong. I guess if Muscly. he's some sort of mischief god, <laughs> it does make sense. Now, Reno realizes it's him and says, Henry, six killers coming. We got to get out of here. I need some life advice real quick. <laughs> yeah. 
Cash Again. continues just beating the hell out of him, throttling him until Bobby Sixkiller shows up and pulls Johnny Cash off of Reno. A terrified Reno stares at the turquoise suit-wearing <laughs> assassin, and we get another great line from this episode. What, do you want to beat it or sit here and wait till the cops get the pull on you? Come on, let's go. Oh boy, it's me, Bobby. Bobby? Bobby Sixkiller? No, it's Newt Gingrich. Now, will you get the heck out of here? It's just Newt Gingrich. I wish it were Newt I Gingrich. I was so happy he was back to himself, though. He I, was, I and felt... he was bubbly. He was up. Yeah, very yeah. cheerful. He's like I, I wisecracking. I missed him just the way Reno missed him. Oh, good. Bobby Sixkiller's back. I would, if, for instance, if either of you turned evil and tried to murder me, I'd be very relieved when you right. when got I... back to normal and started <laughs> making Newt Gingrich jokes. And, and when I arrested Johnny Cash. Yeah. Sure, that, yeah. That's the main thing. <laughs> well, we're clearly back in the present time. It's good. Now, Reno beats Cheeks just as the cops arrive, and the real Bobby Sixkiller explains that, hey, I'm a bounty hunter. There's a warrant out for this Henry Travis. He hands over Johnny Cash to the cops, and we fade to black. Returning from the break, though, Reno makes his way to the beachfront office of Six Color Industries again. Ooh, it's and there this time. It's not Victoria's Bikini Palace. Well, for some reason, he's excited it's that and not yeah. uh, Victoria's Bikini Palace. Oh, well, different priorities. <laughs> we now see the lavender sport coat wearing Bobby Six Killer, <laughs> another cool pastel suit. And the two talk, and Reno asks him, Hey, have you ever thought about the world? Sorry, let me do that again. Hey, have you ever thought about what the world would be like without Six Killer in it? <laughs> And Bobby responds with yet another great line here. Did you ever stop to think what the world would be like if you weren't in it? No. Because you see, there is no world unless I'm in it. He's back. Baby. And he's right, too. I love it, too. I, I love how he's just not willing to get into these theoretical debates at all. Like, nope. that's just not something he does. Bobby's light and carefree. Doesn't, he doesn't think about it. Eventually, though, they, they keep talking about it, and he's like, it would be the same. He says something like that. Like, mm -hmm. if I wasn't here, it would be the same thing. He just doesn't do that. He doesn't think along those lines, but he's good. Which, by the way, turns out to be true. Things are, quote, the same in some ways. That was a point the show was trying to make with no matter what Renegade did, he still ended up alone. Yes. Like in this future world or whatever it was, his wife was with somebody else. So what's the difference? He's dead. His wife's alive, but he still can't have her. So Plus he would be dead. He'd, he'd be dead. <laughs> Which would be preventative as well. You would think. Maybe he's a <laughs> vampire. We don't know. <laughs> now, Reno asks about Johnny Cash, and Six Killer reveals the Cash managed to escape from jail with it seeming like he, quote, vanished into mm. thin air. What does that mean? Hmm. I just can't. Into thin, slow air. <laughs> and Reno gives a nice little chuckle here. He gives Six Killer a big ol' hug. Deep hug. Oh, I love that. And and Six Killer did not. Mm. He did not like he's it. He's a little off, put off by that. Yeah, so Reno then rides <laughs> off <laughs> Reno, into the sunset. Reno, it's not like we're gay or nothing. <laughs> He again just deflects his, <laughs> his emotions. And that's it. That's his first episode of Renegade. What did you guys think? Did you, I mean, I know what you guys think, but tell the audience what you think. Well, you enjoyed this, right, Brian? I had a great deal of fun watching these Renegade episodes because, again, they're not beholden to being good at all. So just <laughs> anything can happen at any time. That was really passive aggressive there. Lots <laughs> of. <laughs> I liked it because it wasn't supposed to be good. <laughs> I don't know what it was supposed to be. I, there's just a lot of action and a lot of people delivering lazily written lines lazily. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. This episode might be some sort of parallel for CTE. I'm not sure <laughs> Yeah. if we're supposed to believe that Reno got hit in the head or, or what happened there. Well, Johnny Cash is bashing his head into the ground. So <laughs> That's yeah. true. I. Yeah. But yeah, th these are very enjoyable because they are... I, I don't want to say that this... It's not like Renegade is a show that... That is that, tongue in cheek or anything, that anything? like that. It takes itself seriously it, to a, a degree. Bit. It also thinks it's funny, mm -hmm. it, but it's just it is very stupid. <laughs> but I mean, but again, <laughs> very eventful. And so it makes for a fun show to watch, kind of like we mentioned with Walker. With Walker, yeah. And we discussed this when we were watching the episodes. You and I did Brian via text. In that '90s excess is so fascinating to me. There was so much money in the country. Because of yeah. it's just the complex. I won't get into the economics of it. But there was so much that you could finance shows like this and they could get away with whatever and they wanted. And cable was booming at mm -hmm. this point, And that, that played a role as well. So I will always enjoy these shows, at least if not in a tongue-in-cheek kind of manner. Spencer, anything to add about the show? What did you see when you saw Renegade the first time? I just time? thought the, the plot line... Once, once you realize what it is, did you not mention the parallels between this and It's a Wonderful Life last time we were talking about it? <laughs> With uh, Jimmy Stewart. I'm pretty Maybe sure you brought that up, which is why would I remember that otherwise? You, you mentioned Jimmy Stewart at some point recently. I believe it's because we I mentioned asked. the plot of this episode. Well, that's, I read it. I, I read figured. the synopsis. So I, I figured think that, that would, it, it can't, because I had forgotten all about that. 
because I'm not going to remember some tip on a plot of a show like this. <laughs> yeah. I'm not. It's not going to stay in my brain. I, mean, I don't. I don't care. So when I saw it, I was like, "Oh, I see what's going on here." And then what you said came back to me, and I thought of all the other things, all the other shows, movies that have tried this. It's you know, a trope. It's, like it's, we can talk about this it's on sitcoms. It's an thing. It's been done. To varying degrees, like it's honestly usually a pretty effective thing mm -hmm. in most cases. I actually like this storyline quite a bit. Like, uh, what would it be like if it if I weren't here? Sort of thing. The Simpsons did it in a really silly way one time in a, an episode where I think Homer's falling for someone at work, and some kind of ghost tells him, "Hey, you know, Was it the ghost of Frank Grimes or whatever, something like that." Mm -hmm. They 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 learned that he would have lived at a mansion. And been playing tennis with his wife or something. If he'd married the the person he was in love with at work, I don't know. They they made fun of it. Of the story, yeah. But there's some there's several times that it's been done in different forms. So I've seen this I've seen the storyline in a number of different ways. So it's interesting that they tried this. <laughs> it's pretty ambitious, honestly, because I didn't I didn't know what they were going for until like halfway into it, where all <laughs> yeah. the stuff it's like, oh, I don't know who you are. Uh, that was that was bold. Of course, it was bad. Of course, it was not well done. But I like that they went for that sort of storyline that's very commonly used. It's, you've seen it in a bunch of different ways. Why not see it here with Reno and, <laughs> and Renegade? Why not? Why not try it this way? So I, I I can appreciate that they tried this, and I I can appreciate that Johnny Cash was in it. There is something sort of cute about when a show this mindless tries to explore more ethereal topics. Mm -hmm. of a little more like, broad. Oh, it's so transparent what you're doing, guys. <laughs> there was a little bit of the, I, I didn't mind it, but there was a little bit of when the first moment of, what? Bobby doesn't know who I am, where I was kind of like, fuck you, show. Like, I don't, I don't know. Like, I don't like want to do one of dumb. these. Come on. Yeah. I get <laughs> one it. One of these, it. like, oh, what's amiss? Like, of course, this is one of the five different major network show tropes of a reason why a character won't know who you are. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's fair. <laughs> now, we have run exceptionally long in this episode, and I thought we would, so I'm going to cut us off here. We'll discuss more about Renegade as a whole. Oh, we, how we sure feel will. about it on the next episode. Definitely tune in for that one, because I reversed these in order that we're talking about them. This is actually the season four episode. We'll be discussing season two, episode 12, Hard Rider, which, of course, comes Lots of hard riders in, in it. You, you guys are going to be shocked. There is a lot more motorcycle riding. A lot more. More than in this episode. And I did that because the next episode is just crazy to me, and I wanted to keep that going. So that's what we'll get into then. There are a ton of guest stars there. The last thing I wanted to say is, do you think that Johnny Cash was contacted by his agent? Like, hey, I can put, I got a role for you. You can be in this show. Or do you think Johnny Cash saw Renegade and was like, yeah, man, this show's pretty badass. I want to be on it. I know which one I hope it is. <laughs> I think it might be the second one. I mean... <laughs> I honestly think that he just did stuff like this, like the Columbo episode yeah, that mm -hmm. he was in. So I, I do think he had people that were constantly reaching out like, hey, do you want to do this? And I bet he did want to. Oh, I feel yeah. like I feel like he knew about the show and he was like, fuck yeah. <laughs> I, I could totally be a motorcycle badass. So I think he probably agreed to it, but I'm sure he didn't come up with the idea. I, but you're going to have to cut down a whole denim tree just for me. <laughs> and some pineapple <laughs> pies. <laughs> All right, well, find us on Twitter. I'm at Manly Van Lee. Brian is at Loud Guitar Brian. Spencer's at the number three French underscore hen. We are at Boob Two Boys on Twitter, as well as Instagram. We have boobtuboys.com. We have patreon.com slash Boob Two Inc. Ooh, if you really like what we do, mouthful. you can us a little bit of cash, and it helps keep the show going. A lot's for better equipment, more things we can do, focus more time and energy and effort on it, so we appreciate it. Once again, patreon.com slash Inc. You get bonus episodes each week. Mm -hmm. We just recorded one where we read scary stories. Go check that out. I was real scared. So for Brian and Spencer, I'm Van Lee. And we'll see you next time on Renegade. Now, also in Renegade, <laughs> Renegade, <laughs> Gabe is out of control. <laughs> oh, no one can you stop me. You thought you could stop Gabe, but Gabe has stolen all of your favorite Skittles out of the package. <laughs>